<laughs> okay, now I got a uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, man, you guys are funny. You know, this is, I, I, I one time was witnessing to uh, doing some street witnessing back in the day, and they were like, you know, I don't believe in organized religion. I said, bro, then come to our church. We are not organized. <laughs> we got chili cook-off, and then we're going to all sit close together at the movie theaters. Come on, y'all. That's love. That's family. That's what we need. Oh, I'm telling you. And listen, we brought we bought 20 tickets, so 20 of y'all better come. We need at least 20 people, okay? And uh, first come. With the, with the money, first uh, get your ticket. That's how it works. So, And it's sold out, so we're, we're, we're doing that. <laughs> and this is, if this is something fun we like, we could do it for the Jesus Revolution movie that's coming out, too. I really want to see that movie. I want to see that movie so bad. All right. God is good. We're in a series called Brand New. Look to your neighbor and say, Brand New. <laughs> now look to your other neighbor and say, Brand New. Yes, I'm, I'm stoked about this message today, brand new, and I need one volunteer, preferably somebody who is 25 or younger, to read my foundational scripture, it's only two verses, so if you can read, 25 and under, come on, we are breaking the stereotypes that Gen Z is awkward and y'all don't know how to get in front of people, do I got a uh, one, one, 125 and and young okay come on wait wait, wait, i thought clover was coming she was about to you're gonna do it clover are you gonna do it come on clover put them all to shame baby girl come on (laughs) well sorry i have it right here can you see all the way up here i don't know how to make this table come down i can't here what 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 you can step on your soul your soul Adaptable, I love you. Hey, it's this one right here. Do you need any help this first? Ephesians 4.31.32. Get rib, rid of all bitterness, rage, and to one another forgive each other just as in Christ God forgive you. High five. You are the woman. Take a bow. Yes. You can go ahead and sit back down. Thank you. She is a queen right there. Not even a princess. That was a queen move. The reading of the word of God is is powerful and effective. There is nothing like the word of God. The word of God changes us. There is power in the word of God. And today we are going to talk about you can't be brand new when you hold on to bitterness. Ooh, Lord have mercy. You can't be brand new if you hold on to bitterness. There is a recurring theme throughout the book of Genesis. I've been really digging in it in my Torah class right now. And uh, there's a theme that, that we don't always talk about, but it is a recurring theme if you pay attention. And it's called fraternal bitterness. Fraternal is a big fancy word for brotherly. Brotherly bitterness. And although today I'm going to break down four examples of this from the book of Genesis, all having to do with brothers, this can do... Men and women, boy and girl, teenager, everybody can get something from this today. Because oftentimes we look at ourselves in our families and think, man, how can God bless this mess? We are dysfunctional. We're a mess. What can we do? 
But this is the thing. God loves a mess. He's not afraid of your mess. He's not afraid of the problems that's within your, your, your family. He's not a, afraid of your dysfunction. As a matter of fact, he chooses broken people. And we see this in the book of Genesis from the very beginning. He chooses broken people. But he doesn't want us to stay broken. And that is where we get confused. We say, oh, well, we're imperfect, and only God is perfect, and so I can just stay broken. I could just stay a mess. I'm just going to walk around a mess all the time. God wants to clean you up. He wants to, he wants to bring healing, and, and he wants to get rid of our brokenness. But in o- order to do that, we really got to let go of our bitterness. Bitterness is a fancy word for some maybe of the kids that are in here may not understand what the word bitterness means. So I'm going to have a few of us. Shout out, since everybody is thinking this mic has a snake in it. So I'm going to have a few of us shout out what you think bitterness is. That was a good practice there. He said, out. Come on. Give me one other word or two or so that you think bitterness might mean. I'm listening. Airwax. (laughs) Yeah, I have that problem sometimes. (laughs) I heard it runs in the family. Um, What I heard something over here. Holding a grudge. Ooh, what else? What can bitterness mean? Give me something, somebody. Unforgiveness. Envious. Ooh, she graduated from Bowling Green, okay? That's a true millennial right there. Graduated from Bowling Green. There's hope for for those of you who are in Bowling Green right now. I won't point you out. But come on, can I get a college student? Tell me what they think bitterness might mean. What's that? Jealousy. Ooh, Jamie, you in college still, girl? No, <laughs> she's like, no. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I know I'm a little sassy today. I've, I've had a lot of caffeine. Jesus and caffeine runs through these blood vessels, friends. Um, anything else? Anything else? We've got some good ones there. The opposite of sweetness. Ooh, look at that. All right, so we got the opposite of sweetness. We got, we got all the other things that you guys said. <laughs> and holding on to grudges, being envious, being jealous. All those things are bitterness. And this is the thing, friends, like bitterness, in psychology they call it embitterness, and it is having hurt from somebody that you feel like you just can't really do anything about it, okay? But the Bible talks about biblical, uh, it talks biblically about bitterness, and we can do something about it. We can lay it at the feet of Jesus. We can lay our hurt, our jealousy, our offenses, our anger, a rage at the feet of Jesus. That's why the scripture that, that little Harley <laughs> Clover read was, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, that sweetness. Forgiving each other just as Christ through God forgave you. Just as in Christ God forgave you. You can't be brand new and remain bitter. Okay. So we're going to talk about this fraternal bitterness that we see this reoccurring theme throughout the book of Genesis. The very first thing we're going to talk about is Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. What about that? Cain and Abel, the very first sons in the Bible from Adam and Eve, the very first sons in the biblical book of Genesis. Cain and Abel were the two first sons from Adam and Eve. Cain was the firstborn, and he was a farmer. And his brother Abel, well, he was a shepherd. The brothers made sacrifices to God, and God favored Abraham's sacrifice instead of Cain's. Yeah, he favored Abel's sacrifice instead of Cain's. The scripture says in Genesis here, it says, But on Cain's offering, he, speaking of God, did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face downcast. He was angry. And he was sad. The next verse says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you so angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Put that next slide up. This is what sin looks like at our door, a lion ready to attack. That word crouching is getting yourself, that sin's getting itself in position to pounce, to attack. 
The Bible says in the New Testament that the enemy comes around like a roaring lion looking to whom he may devour. Sin is our enemy. It brings separation from God and separation from each other. And sin is looking to take us out. God warned the very first son. He said, why are you so angry? He said, if you do what's right, won't you be accepted? Why so downcast? And then he gave him a warning, be careful, because sin is there. Sin is there, crouching at your door. The Bible says, to be, to in your anger, do not sin. You can be angry, it's an emotion, but do not sin in your anger. And so when we look at this story here of Cain and Abel, sometimes we wonder, well, why did God favor Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's? And really, honestly, we don't know. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of um, different people that may have different guesses, but the Bible never really clearly says it. And I believe that there's a reason that God sometimes leaves things unclear. The reason why is because he wants us to continue to search out the scriptures and ask for God for a deeper meaning. And one of the things I think maybe is maybe it was uh, Cain was being tested by the praise he did not receive. See, the scripture says we're tested by the praise we do receive. Like after that intro today, I'm probably going to have to really pray because, <laughs> I mean, now I don't, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to preach without cowbells again. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? So I'm probably going to have to pray about that. <clears throat> but sometimes we're tested by the praise we don't receive. Have you ever, you know, thought you were supposed to get a promotion and somebody else did and not you? Maybe in school you tried out for a sport or a play and someone else got it, not you. That hurts. That feels bad. And sometimes we're tested by those things. How do you react when someone else gets a, a raise that you think you deserve? Or when someone else gets the recognition that you think you desire and deserve? Well, Cain, how he rea reacted, friends, is he, he murdered his brother. And when God asked him about it, this is how he replied. He said, am I my brother's keeper? In this question, we see selfishness, the selfishness of human nature. That because he didn't get the recognition that he wanted, or for whatever reason, that sin was crouching at his door and he was not able to master it, he took matters into his own hands and he murdered a human being. That is how far bitterness can take you. And, and maybe we could say, well, at least I'm not a murderer. You know, that's what everybody says. You know, I'm not a bad person. I never killed anyone. I mean, why do we got to go there? <laughs> like, the most extreme. Like, have you lied on somebody? Have you slandered somebody? Have you talked smack? Oh, I went back to the 90s on you. What do we say about that now? What's the new way of saying that? Maya, come on, what do we say? Have we? Throwing shade? He's a millennial. Is there anything cooler than that? No? Come on. You guys leave me hanging. Okay, okay. But that's the thing. When we, when we slander somebody, we murder their character. Lord help us, amen. I could close right now, <laughs> but I'm not because there's even more crazier stories. This is the thing. Cain never got rid of his bitterness, and it consumed him. It could consume us too. Another example of fraternal bitterness that we see here um, in the book of Genesis is from what they call the first family. So the first chosen family. We talked about the first family, Adam and Eve and their children. Now, this is the first chosen family, and this is the son of Abraham, and it is the sons of Abraham, Ishmael and Isaac. We got a picture of that? <laughs> Ishmael and Isaac. You see what, 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 the big one's Ishmael. You see what he's doing? What's he doing? Someone shout out. What's he doing? He's teasing. He's making fun of his younger brother. How many of us have ever done that? Come on. Not me. My younger brother's way bigger than me. <laughs> no, but when he was little, I would do it. Not really. I was a protective a sister, but probably. I probably made fun of you. I don't remember. <laughs> but how many of us do that? We make fun of other people. I just did this yesterday. I'm not going to lie. I don't know. I thought I was super funny about something, and I made fun of somebody very close to me, to their face, of course. That's the type of person I am. 
and I sang a song about it. It was bad. It was bad. I sing, too. It's like living in a musical with someone who's, like, out, totally out of tune. But, it, you know, to me, it's fun. And I was called out on it by one of my other children. I said, Mom, you went too far. And I had to make it right. My butt went in there and made a little apology. No, and put a $5 Starbucks card in it real quick. <laughs> you got to make it right. Right? When we hurt someone's feelings, we don't want to be the type of people that say, oh, that's, you need to get th thicker skin and, and gaslight people and make it like it's all them and not us. We need to humble ourselves. Because if we don't humble ourselves, it brings separation. That is what sin does. It brings separation. In Genesis 2, 8 through 10, I'm going to read the message version for the children in here. I understand this is a paraphrased version, but I think it breaks it down real good. It says, the baby grew, this is talking about Isaac, and was weaned. Abraham threw a big party on the day Isaac was weaned. One day Sarah saw that the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham, poking fun of her son Isaac. This was a first blended family here in the, New, or in the Old Testament book of Genesis. And she told Abraham, get rid of the slave woman and her son. No child of the slave is going to share an inheritance with my son Isaac. And we can, we can break it down theology and say, oh, but, you know, one was the, son, the seed of the chosen and one was not and this and that. Yes, probably true. According to, to our doctrine, that is what we believe. However, there's been many blended families that stay together in the Bible, including the next one we're going to talk about. But this, there had to be a separation. And it started from poking fun, this rivalry between brothers. Why do we poke fun of other people? Why do we make fun of other people? Oftentimes it has more of a reflection of what we feel about ourselves than what we really see in somebody else, right? Oftentimes we're projecting what the insecurities that we have onto somebody else. Well, if we make fun of them, then maybe the people won't see how hurting we truly are. And friends, it's something that we need to get a hold of, okay? And this thing is, if we look at this, actually the division between Ishmael and Isaac is still one of the biggest divisions today because the descendants of Ishmael, came, that, that is Islam. And the descendants of Isaac is Jewish people and Christians and still a great divide. And the Bible says that he wishes that none would perish, that everybody would come to salvation. Amen. So if that's something that, that, you know, you've caught yourself doing, that's something we need to repent and ask God to forgive us. We're moving on quickly here. We're on a, the, the third example that I have of brothers. Oh, I love this picture. Woo, yes, Jacob and Esau. Esau was the big, hairy one. Can you tell which one that is, kids? Yeah, the big, hairy one. And Jacob was the little one who knew how to cook. Now, that's kind of funny because look at the big one. You would think he would be the one that knows how to cook. No, he was bringing home the meat. He was bringing home the bacon. <laughs> <laughs> and he knew how to eat, but Jacob knew how to cook. And, and the scripture talks, I'm going to read a little bit about this because this is a really good one. This, this, this story here, it shows the uh, rivals, for that the, these guys were, were rivals much of their life. Actually, they were fraternal twins, okay? And the scripture says that even, even in their mother's womb, they were wrestling with one another, okay? And this is, they, they were twins who competed for spiritual blessings, land, money, uh, uh, prominence. They, 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 they competed for everything. The Bible says Isaac favored Esau, the dad, but Rebekah favored Isaac. Favor, or, excuse me, but Rebekah, well, she liked Isaac too, but she favored Jacob, okay? So in this, we see that favoritism leads to rival, rivalry, rivalry, Lord, Hate L's. <laughs> yes, it does. It leads to jealousy. Favoritism leads to jealousy. And this is hard. I tell all my kids that are their, my favorite behind each other's back, except for the other day when only one got up and took out the trash when I asked three of them, and then I told them in front of everybody that he was my favorite. But um, <laughs> And he got his tacos first. Um, but, <laughs> but I hope my kids know that I truly love each of them in their own unique way, not one more than the other. But favoritism, it can create jealousy and it can create an unhealthy competition between, between our children. So these boys, they grew into men um, as different as night and, and day. 
Esau was the outdoors man. He loved to spend his time hunting in the fields. Jacob was a mired mild-mannered homeboy at home, maybe a mama's boy, they would say. He learned to cook. He preferred to stay around the tents instead of going out into the fields to work. Uh, unfortunately, you know, Isaac and Rebecca, they really did contribute to this conflict between them. And so this is a very long story here, but I'm going to sum it up in this. Jacob was so jealous of, of Esau, and um, he ended up tricking Esau by giving him a bowl of soup, but he didn't give it to him without payment. He said, oh, you want this bowl? You hungry? Look at him. Bro was hungry, okay? (laughs) He's like, you hungry? You're going to have to sell me your birthright. And listen, I feel Esau because when I'm hungry, I do really stupid things too. (laughs) Without, Without really thinking through, he sold his birthright. And later in life, Jacob tricked the dad into giving him the blessing. And there was just rivalry between the two of them, back and forth. Um, finally, after Jacob w- went, ran away, because basically Esau was going to murder him, <laughs> and, and he was warned, and he ran away, and he went to his mother's um, family and to a different land. He went through all kinds of stuff. And finally, he did come back, and there was a bit of a, an amends. But they never had the kind of, you know, when they talk about twin, that, like that twin thing that some twins have, <laughs> that connection. They didn't have this because of favoritism that led to division. And so, friends, parents, we've got to be careful that every single one of our kids, every single one of our grandkids know that they are loved. Not one more than the other in their unique way. I don't love Jubilee the same way I love Shua because they're not the same people. But I love them on the, the same level in their unique way. And this is the thing. If we deal with jealousy, then most likely we deal with comparison. And Theodore Roosevelt said one of the greatest things he ever said was, comparison is the thief of joy. If we wonder why we're not full of joy, get off of Facebook and Instagram for just a little bit and stop comparing your life to all these pictures that you see. Because I'm telling you right now, Everything that you're seeing, on, they're not putting on there. Oh, I just got in a fight with my husband. My kids suck. I'm running late to church. Okay, they're not, I'm never going to take a picture of that. Sorry, it happens. My husband doesn't suck. He took me on a couple dates this week. He's on my good side. But it happens. We get mad at those we love, and we usually don't post about it. We only post about the highlight reel. However, it's not real life. And I'm afraid that we are, the re- one of the reasons why our nation and, and really our world is entering into the biggest mental health crisis we've ever seen. Part of it, and there's studies about this, is, is because of social media. We're living on our phones and we're forgetting about the people in front of us. Yeah, we're living on our phones and we're forgetting about the people in front of us and it's causing mental health issues. We're dealing with anxiety more than we've ever dealt with. We're dealing with depression more than we've ever dealt with. We're in it and we're comparing ourselves. Back in the day, it was just keeping up with the Joneses on the corner. Now it's keeping up with everybody that we see on the internet. And it's hard. And we feel less than. We feel unworthy. We feel lonely. We're more supposedly connected and more lonely than ever before. Put your phone down and get with the people in front of you. Go out. Have a conversation face-to-face. Okay? I know. Gen Z, I love y'all. Like, talk to each other. Like, get to, you know how I got to know Josh? He came, well, he was actually at the church before me, but I didn't really realize that. But when I noticed him, I'm like, hey, you want to come out to eat after, after church with a group of us? It's that easy. Because when, this is the thing, if we don't include people and bring them in, and you can't just put it on one person, okay, all of us should be making the initiative. Oh, but, I, you know, I, I'm new, and nobody knows me, and this and that, and they didn't include me. Well, did you ask them over? Did you give them a phone call? Did you text them? Like, be the friend that you want, right? Because if not, we're going to be in this spiral, this downward spiral of comparison and jealousy, and it will lead to division. It will lead to separation. You will feel lonely. It's not God's will for your life. Amen? All right, so this last example, this is finally a good example we're ending with here, the book, the end of the book of Genesis, and this is Joseph and his brothers. And when I say good example, I mean it got good. It didn't start good. <laughs> because out of all the brothers, this one 
other than, than poor Abel, whose blood spoke out from the ground, this one was one of the worst. And it almost ended up being an Abel story because Joseph, again, was favored by his father. He had a fancy coat. Okay, It would be like probably nowadays like if, if a parent gave only one child like the most fanciest car. Okay, This, this, was, this was a delicacy. This was something that, that, that wasn't. Um, around, not any of the other kids got it. He's one of the younger sons. He got this fancy coat. And so the brothers didn't like him. And he was kind of a younger brother, kind of a big mouth. He had a dream, you know, that his brothers would basically bow down to him. <laughs> yeah. Then he had another dream, basically meaning the same thing. His brothers and his parents would eventually, I mean, the sun and moon basically would bow down to him. Re- read the scriptures. I'm paraphrasing. I mean, that's pretty much what the scripture says. And instead of him pondering up that, keeping it in his heart, he decided, let me go tell my brothers who hate me, y'all going to bow down to me. Yeah. What? Why are you mad? Why are you looking at me like that? It was a dream from God. (laughs) Now, when I read, scholars believe that Joseph was 17. It makes sense. Right? Right? His prefrontal cortex was definitely not developed yet. (laughs) It makes sense. And the brothers didn't like him. They were making fun of him. They couldn't stand him. He was usually at home by the tents. He was learning. He was very educated. While the brothers were out doing the hard work underneath the hot sun farming. Well, one day, his dad sent him to the brothers to give, deliver a message, and the brothers saw him coming from a, a ways off, and they said, let's take care of him. And they, want, they, pl- they, they devised a plan. They wanted to murder him. The oldest brother, Reuben, was like, no, how about let's just, th- oh, look over there. There's a well. Let's just throw him in that for right now. And they're like, okay, cool. Now, in Reuben's mind, he was going to go back and rescue him, you know. And so they threw him in a well. Unfortunately, then c- came some Ishmaelites who were basically slave traders, and they were like, well, why kill them? We can make some money. I mean, you got to appreciate their hustle at least, you know. (laughs) They were like, why kill them? We can make some money. Let's sell them. They sold them into slavery. And so here's Joseph. I mean, went from a prince to a slave. Can you imagine that? He was, he was taken to Egypt. He was put into the house of Potiphar and ended up becoming basically the head of Potiphar's household. And then Potiphar's crazy, cooler, hoochie mama, mama, not mama, hoochie mama, wife, decided this guy looks kind of buff, <laughs> which you wonder how when he was sitting back at home, not really working in the field, but hey. I guess for her, you know, she was like, I like this dude. And so the Bible says he was handsome. So she tried to get him, you know, to give him some smoochies and stuff. We got kids in here. And basically, she lied on him. She made up some lies and stories. And so he was taken as a slave and now put into prison. Okay? And prison back then didn't have Wi-Fi, (laughs) y'all, and three square meals. It was like in a pit. It It was once again in another pit like the well. In a, in a dungeon place, terrible, terrible, terrible. And guess what? In there, Potiphar, or in there, Pharaoh had two servants. I will just call them the butler and the baker, okay? And the butler and the baker had a dream. And guess who was there who interpreted the dream for him? Joseph. Once again, a dream. This time, the dream, instead of getting him in trouble, set him free. After a while, they did forget about him for, for a little bit. But after a while, he was set free because, once again, Potiphar had a dream. And when Potiphar, who was the king of Egypt, had a dream, why do I keep calling him Potiphar? Pharaoh. When Pharaoh had a dream, Pharaoh went and got, you know, no one could interpret it. And so here comes Joseph. And Joseph interprets his dream. Long story short, Joseph becomes the second ruler of Egypt. And part of the dream uh, that, that he interpreted that was from God is that there was going to be a famine that was going to come to the land. But first there was going to be seven years of plenty and they need to save up. Some of us need to learn that. Me, Lord, I'm preaching to me. And then there was seven years of famine, but, but Joseph prepared. And so he, he saved up. And this happened all over all of the Middle East. So the brothers of Joseph were hungry and they heard that Egypt had bread. And so 
Jacob sent his brothers there. Right away, Joseph recognized his brothers, but, you know, he was dressed up all fancy and lots of time went by, so the brothers didn't recognize him. So he kind of pretended not to be who he was. Eventually, he did a couple little tests on the brothers to see if they were changed. Eventually, he saw that they, you know, had changed some. And so he revealed himself to his brothers. Now, some of us who might have been bitter from all that pain would have threw those brothers in prison. Or at least in a well, like payback a little bit, right? (laughs) Maybe sell them into slavery. But instead, Joseph, Joseph forgave his brothers. He forgave his brothers. This is the thing, that to get rid of bitterness, you have to have forgiveness. You remember the very first scripture we read that Miss Clover read where it said, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, and every form of malice. And then it says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Joseph here was a type of Christ that was showing the power of forgiveness. How powerful is forgiveness? So this is the thing, friends. We all have dysfunction in our families. We all have struggles with our siblings, and not just with our siblings. With our, we, there's so many people with mommy and daddy issues clear into their 40s and 50s still. And there's people who then get in their 40s and 50 issues and then are causing mommy, daddy issues in their children. <laughs> it happens. The Bible says that, uh, that two, the, in, in the book of Genesis, it talks about how two uh, of the animals according to their kinds. Friends, unfortunately, parents sometimes produce children with the same exact issues that they have. And we have to recognize that. And somebody has to stand up and say, I'm not going to be bitter. Joseph's father, Jacob, dealt with brotherly bitterness. Jacob's father, Isaac, dealt with brotherly bitterness. The very first family created by God had brothers who were so bitter they mur- th- that one was murdered. Friends, we have to be careful to deal with the bitterness in our families. And the way we deal with it is we choose to forgive. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It is a choice. And from that choice, it is an action. And sometimes daily we have to choose to forgive. That doesn't mean that, that we don't have boundaries. That doesn't mean that there's, there's immediate reconciliation. Okay? Sometimes in our forgiveness, we have to release the people, to, uh, depending especially on the harm that was done to us. But forgiveness, what it does is it releases you from prison, from bondage. And we have to have forgiveness. And if we want our children to forgive one another, and to forgive others, then we need to model forgiveness to them. When we do wrong, we need to humble ourselves and apologize. When they do wrong and they apologize to us, we need to actually forgive them and let it go and not hold it over their head, not hold a grudge. We are not perfect people. And neither was the families that were in the book of Genesis. God gave us this messed up family, the the chosen family, to show us it's a human problem, not a you problem. A human problem. That's what sin is. It's a human problem. But Jesus became human. He took on the nature of a servant. He humbled himself and became obedient. And he died on the cross, and he took our sin upon himself so that when God looks at us, that he can see Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross and how Jesus, he resurrected in power, representing new life, that we can have new life. You can be brand new, but not if you hold on to bitterness. We gotta, 
The Bible says, forgive others as you have been forgiven. Who? I'm going to end with this verse here in Genesis. This is 50, verse 20. This is what Joseph said to his brothers. Because his brothers were scared once they realized, ooh, that's Joseph. Oh, snap. We about to get it. That's what they were thinking. And Genesis 50, verse 20 says, as for you, you met evil against me, but God met it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Joseph learned the key to getting over bitterness is forgiveness. He also learned that God has a plan to use your pain for his glory. Would you stand to your feet if you're able to, please? Kids, you guys are awesome. I know I'm not as animated here as as Pastor Jill and, and Carrie and all the other ones who teach you. But it's important, I believe, for our kids to see our see their parents listening and, and receiving the word of God. And friends, we are living in a generation that the faith is no longer being passed down to the next generation. And that is scary. Deuteronomy says that 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 to show that you it basically if you really love God, then you show that by passing on your love and faith to God to the next generation. To write these commands on your hearts, to put them on your heads, to teach them to your children. It is not just taking them to church, it's teaching that to your children how to forgive, modeling, how to forgive, how to live, how to, to walk in humility. Family dysfunction is just as prevalent today as it was in the book of Genesis. But we have Jesus, and through him, we can be like Joseph. We can let go of hurt. We can let go of bitterness, and we can let go of unforgiveness. Could you bow your heads with me? Jesus. 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 I want you to make an altar right at your seat, right where you're at right now. If you know that you have some unforgiveness, somebody that you need to out loud to God, say, God, I forgive them. Would you raise your hand before the Lord? Raise your hand before the Lord. If you have any, yeah, yeah, yep, we got to forgive. Got to forgive. Got to forgive. There's, yep. Let's just take a moment right where you're at, and you just say, God, help me forgive. And then you say that person's name. You can whisper it. You don't got to be loud, or you can even say it in your mind if you want. That's more comfortable. And then I want you to say, God, I choose. I make a choice. I don't feel it necessary, but I make a choice to forgive this person. Go ahead and say that out loud. Or in your mind, however you feel comfortable, make a choice to forgive them. Father, I pray for every single person that just spoke those words to you, Lord, that you would give them the strength to walk this out, that that choice would lead to action, to walk it out forgiveness, that they would be released from the prison of bitterness. Some of you in here have been dealing, you're not to a place of unforgiveness, but you've been dealing with bitterness, jealousy, rage, slander against somebody else. Maybe you've been dealing with comparison. You find yourself in a place of constant insecurity because you're comparing yourself to other people. If that's you, would you raise your hand before the Lord? Raise your hand before the Lord. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, 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 yes. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You don't have to compare yourself to anyone else. God has a plan and purpose for your life. He doesn't want a bunch of clones. He wants you to be the uniquely person, uniquely you, the person he created you to be. Father God, I pray you would break off comparison. Break it off of me too, Lord. Our church doesn't have to look like the church down the street. My family doesn't have to look like the, the beautiful Instagram family, Lord. We don't have to always be perfect. We mess up. We make mistakes. But God, you are good. And your grace is sufficient. God, break bitterness. Break jealousy. Break rage. Break, break it, Lord, so we can walk in forgiveness. So we can forgive ourselves, Lord Jesus. God, if there's dysfunction, and I know there is, because we're human beings, and our families, Lord, would you show us so that we can pray. We can repent to you. We can ask for forgiveness. We can change. We can turn our hearts back to our children. That is what pre-revival is. It's fathers turning their hearts back to their children. 
God, I pray, Lord God, that you would wake up a generation that would have a heart for the next generation. And God, it wouldn't just be the out oldest among us, but God, even young adults, God, I thank you for the young adults in this church, Lord God, that they have a heart for teenagers, Lord. Would you grow that, Lord Jesus? We don't want to pass down religion, but God, we want to set an example of what it means to have a personal relationship with Christ. Help us not be afraid to worship, to proclaim your name, to gather together, to encourage one another, Break off the awkwardness that tries to attack us, Lord Jesus. Make us feel weird or stared at. And God, help us be okay with being who we are. God, I pray you would break off perfectionism in families. God, that you would help us, Lord Jesus. Realize that our children are not perfect. They're gonna make mistakes. They're gonna mess up. Help us not be that parent that, that is that won't accept them when they mess up, that won't welcome them back in. Yes, Lord, we need to have standards, but just like we are sinners and we have fallen short of the standard you have set, our children are gonna fall short and they need to see a loving, compassionate parent saying, it's okay, we're gonna make it through. God forgives you and so do I. Break generational curses, Lord Jesus. Break generational curses in Jesus' name. Off your people. Off your people. Help us love our children. Help, our chi help the children love their parents. Help us love our siblings. Care for our siblings that we wouldn't be jealous. We wouldn't be insecure. And not just our physical blood relatives, but God, you say that you are our heavenly father. And we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And some of us are jealous and envious of one another. Thinking that someone else got it better than us. Lord, I deal with this at times, from time to time as well. And God, I repent. No one's better than anyone else. God, break that off of us when we feel like we're not enough or we're too much. Lord, break it, break it, break it, break it in Jesus' name. Help us love one another. Help us reach out to one another. Help us have koinonia, fellowship with one another. Today, Lord God, in this week, help us reach out. Care for one another. Be compassionate and kind and loving. Grow us, Lord. Grow us. Mature us so we can make a difference. For your name and for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. If you